those four highest points in Arizona are only a remnant of what that mountain used to be. And at the end of the road is what they call the end of the world. For a long time, they were hunter-gatherers. And as weird as it sounds, just stick your nose right in there. You can see we're up here in Flagstaff, Northern Arizona, right around 7,000 feet. And it's rich in this really dense ponderosa pine forest. But like looking out here, you see no trees, nothing for about a mile across. That's about how big the basin of this lake is. So what's going on here is this whole area is the result of volcanic eruptions. For the past 6 million years or so, volcanoes in Northern Arizona have been periodically erupting, creating this big mountain range that we call the San Francisco Volcanic Field. As that lava is erupting onto the surface, you know, it's hardening into really hard, dense, igneous basalt. But that basalt is rich in all different kinds of minerals. So as water and snow melt and erosion kind of break down those igneous rocks into their mineral parts, some of those minerals kind of get converted into clays. And right here, what's going on, all that clay is kind of accumulating and it's creating a seal kind of at the bottom of this basin. So water can permeate through different kinds of rocks. Different levels of rocks have kind of different levels of permeability. But shale and kind of like mud rocks or just like clay rocks, they have really, really fine grains and it's very difficult for water to actually pass through them. So right here, we've got this big basin kind of filled with a nice seal of clay. And so as like snow melt and rainfall, it comes off the mountains, right here, it'll build up in the springtime. So right now, you're looking out at a nice open grassy field. But if you come here, you know, six, 10 months from now, this could be totally filled with water and make a nice shallow kind of wetland ecosystem that's really important to our forests. What I'm looking for when I'm out and about is, you know, what kind of doesn't belong. We've got this nice natural basin, this nice natural prairie, but then all of a sudden right here, there's this elevation that's like long and straight. And you really don't find that in nature. So this is some kind of man-made raised area. And what this likely was, was a foundation for a railroad line. So going back to like the beginning of the 20th century, this forest was heavily logged. And they used railroads to get, you know, the loggers out to the field and the logs back to the train. So this whole raised area right here was once a railroad line used for logging. But now it's a nice trail that you can walk along, enjoy the views. And this is a really, really great place to watch for wildlife because in these kind of forests throughout the Southwest, we have intermittent wetlands but they make up less than 1% of the total forest area. But that wetland, that water leads to huge biodiversity in vegetation and in insects and in animals. So that wetland vegetation is really, really rich forage for things like deer and elk and pronghorn antelope, you know, our grazing animals. So they'll often come through here and graze on that nice wetland forage. Then, during the migratory seasons, the waterfowl, the birds that are migrating north and south, they need these pockets of wetlands to kind of rest and, and land on. So this is all part of actually two different corridors. So animals that are migrating kind of north and south will go through what they call the Woody Mountain Ridge Corridor, which basically runs from the mountain over there to Rogers Lake and then further on down until you get to the edge of the Colorado Plateau. So this is a very important migratory route for both birds and animals. But then also going kind of east to west, we've got a lake out to the east of us called Dry Lake. And then way out beyond those mountains over there is what's called Garland Prairie. And this is another important Garland corridor for the animals to migrate through. So as these animals are moving from place to place, you know, water is kind of the most important resource for life. So they need these intermittent wetlands so that they can migrate to new areas, to new foraging, to, you know, sometimes breeding grounds. So these wetlands are really, really important for, you know, the 
the game animals and the birds that come through northern Arizona. This mountain is part of the San Francisco Peaks. So that is the largest volcano in that San Francisco volcanic field. And on the kind of left side of the mountain there, you can see one peak that rises up higher than the rest. That peak is called Humphreys Peak. And at 12,633 feet, that is the highest point in Arizona. Then Arizona's other four highest points are the other peaks on the mountain. So if we start at the left, that's Humphreys. Right in the middle there, that's Agassiz Peak, coming in at about 12,360 feet. And then further to the right, you go over the saddle, kind of the next peak, that's Fremont Peak. And then kind of at the very end there, before the mountain disappears, there's one more peak called Doyle Peak. But those four highest points in Arizona are only a remnant of what that mountain used to be. That mountain used to be much higher than it is today. So that's what you would call an old stratovolcano. And stratovolcanoes are this kind of volcano that erupts in such a way where it kind of mixes, you know, lava rock with more like pyroclastic blasts and it builds up a very tall pointy mountain. So almost all stratovolcanoes kind of rise up to one central peak. But we don't have that here. We've got multiple peaks all in this kind of surrounding this one inner basin. So what geologists think is that when that mountain originally formed, all of those peaks connected into one central mountain range. So kind of try to picture in your mind's eye that slope coming up from the left to Humphreys and that slope coming up from the right on Doyle and Fremont will just continue way up higher into the air to where they would have reached at one spot. And that's how the volcano originally looked maybe about 500,000 years or so. The first eruption happened about a million years ago and between about 1 million and 400,000 years, that volcano was active. It erupted a few different times, creating this massive, large stratovolcano. Now, the controversy comes up in what happened to the top of that mountain? You know, why isn't it there anymore? And there are a couple different competing theories that you'll hear around Flagstaff. One theory is that, kind of similar to how Mount St. Helens erupted in the 1980s, is that this mountain formed its cone and then a secondary eruption kind of blew off the top of it and that's what gave us the Ring of Peaks. That theory though doesn't have a lot of actual geologic evidence. There's not actual like volcanic rock from that eruption that we can say, yep, this mountain definitely had a secondary eruption. The other competing theory is that basically the mountain and the cone kind of collapsed in on itself. So basically imagine that mountain kind of rising up to that central peak and then over time it couldn't support its own weight and it just kind of collapsed and crumbled in on itself and that might have gave us our ring of peaks. So either a secondary eruption or a cone collapse kind of led to the mountain's original downfall. But what's also been affecting the mountain for the past two million years or so at least are different ice ages. So over the past two and a half million years or so, the earth has gone through these cooling periods and during those ice ages, these mountains were high enough to have glaciers. So at one point in time, there was a glacier on top of that mountain that was four miles long, a thousand feet thick. It was huge. And when that glacier mel melted, all that meltwater would have flushed out the inner basin, taken away a lot of the top of the San Francisco peaks. Then there were a few more kind of glacial periods about 20,000 years ago, and then again about 10,000 years ago. And that's what we know of. There could have been even more glaciers going back even further. There's just not geologic evidence for that yet. So we had this mountain as one kind of massive big peak. And then through either a secondary eruption or a cone collapsed, it kind of exposed the inner basin. And then over millions and millions of years, through rainfall, through snowfall, and even glacial melts, this mountain has kind of eroded away until we've got this ring of peaks that you can see today. Woody Mountain Road here is a really cool road just south of Flagstaff that is technically called Forest Road 231, but 
this road leads out to some old fire lookout towers. So Woody Mountain in 1904 was pretty much completely logged out. So the whole mountain was just bare of trees and the Forest Service came through and they were like, we got this big mountain that has no trees on it and 360 degree panoramic views. Let's build a fire outlook tower up there. So that's what they did in the early 1900s, built the fire outlook tower and would man forest rangers up there just scanning the horizon looking for you know smoke or any signs of fire possibly approaching flagstaff well since that mountain was completely logged all the trees have grown back so now there aren't 360 degree panoramic views so the old fire outlook tower isn't really in use today but that's kind of the history of this area is that it was for logging, it was for ranching, and the Forest Service used it as a fire station. Now, as we keep going down this road, eventually we will get to the end. And at the end of the road is what they call the end of the world. It's kind of the edge of this high elevated plateau we're on, and there's another fire outlook tower in that direction because on the edge of the plateau, we've also got miles and miles of views as you kind of look out over the lowlands of Sedona and you can even see kind of down to Jerome and you know, depending on how clear it is, you can see a good ways out there. So Woody Mountain Road here was used for access to those fire towers. And today it's used mostly for recreation. So you've got Rogers Lake natural area, which is really fun to you know, go hang out at, do some bird watching, do some light hiking. And then throughout the forest here, you've got many premier like campgrounds, or not campgrounds, but camping spots where you can pitch a tent and you know, enjoy yourself. So Woody Mountain Road is a, a really cool road to check out when you're coming to Flagstaff. It is a dirt road, gravel road, so you, know, you can't take every car down it, but it doesn't get so intense that you know you need a, a high clearance like Jeep or you know four wheel drive truck. Like you can pretty much get out here with you know a, a solid you know mid sized car, crossover SUV, you know truck, whatever you got. You're gonna be okay heading down Woody Mountain Road. Ponderosa pine is the dominant tree throughout kind of Flagstaff, northern Arizona, this elevated area. And ponderosa pine trees are really, really cool. As they grow taller, they go through this kind of self pruning process where all the low lying branches will start to die and kind of fall away from the tree. But that helps the tree survive these periodic wildfires that the Southwest is prone to. So you can look up at the trees and you'll notice the branches that actually have needles on them are way up, elevated above the forest floor. Sometimes it's 20 feet, sometimes 30 feet, sometimes they're 40 feet up above you. So if a fire comes through, it's gonna be burning these grasses and these shrubs down on the ground and come over here and look at this trunk. You can see we've also got some black scorching right here on the trunk from where a fire came through in the past. But this trunk bark is so incredibly thick that it insulates the tree from that surrounding fire. So by having a high crown and a really thick trunk bark, as the fires burn along the forest floor, these trees are able to survive. And then as all this kind of plant life and debris on the floor of the forest gets burned up, it's very nutrient dense. So those nutrients cycle back into the soil and it helps to kind of fertilize the forest floor. So while wildfires are like the biggest natural disaster that you'll hear about in Arizona, the fire in the Ponderosa Pine Forest is very important to the cycle of nutrients into the forest floor, into the soil. So that's why today you'll hear about things like prescribed burns and controlled burns, basically trying to use fire to our advantage. This is the needle from a Ponderosa. You can see, so these three needles coming off of one little patch here and they're pretty long much longer than say your like pinyon pine or your douglas fir trees and what that does is as those branches kind of shed away the needles are going to shed away as well and these long needles kind of create a blanket on the forest floor 
and that blanket blocks out the sunlight and prevents other plants from growing. So that's why ponderosas kind of dominate the landscape here. They're able to outcompete their other plants. But there is one other tree that you'll quite often find growing with the ponderosas, and that's our oak tree. This is what you call gamble oak. It's an oak kind of native out here to the southwest, and it's also highly adapted to those fires. So if you look right here, you kind of see like a cluster of trees. That whole cluster is likely one tree. So underneath the ground, all those trunks are connected by one root system. And then as those fires burn along the forest floor, they burn up those trees. But those roots are insulated underneath the ground. So as the fire passes through, the, the gamble oak can just kind of shoot up these small, fast-growing trunks. And that's how it survives the wildfires out here in Arizona. Oak trees are known for the acorns they produce. And if you process them correctly, acorns are edible and they're actually a pretty good food source. So for people that have living, been living in the Southwest kind of Flagstaff area for at least 5,000, probably 10,000 years or so, for a long time they were hunter-gatherers. So the deer and the elk and the, the rabbits and the squirrels, the game animals provided sustenance, but they were also gathering a lot of native plant material as a food source. So acorns, were one of those foods that some of the tribes might take advantage of. And there is evidence in this area going back to, you know, 10,000 years ago, the last ice age, the time when we talk about the Clovis people in North America, they have found Clovis points in and around the Rogers Lake area. So we know that going back to the last ice age, hunters and gatherers were also coming through this area using the resources from the water in Rogers Lake or from, you know, maybe the acorns here or the animals in the forest. So while the Southwest is kind of, you know, a dry desert climate that looks pretty tough to live in, if you know what you're doing and you have the knowledge and the history out here, people have survived here for thousands and thousands of years. Since we're in a pine forest, we're hanging out with a bunch of conifers and evergreens, not known for its fall foliage, but that's where the gamble oak is so special. This is one of the only deciduous trees you'll find at this kind of elevation. And you can see we're out here in mid-October and the leaves are changing into a beautiful orange color, kind of going from their, their summer green into their fall oranges, you know, getting ready to drop these leaves for the winter. What I think is really cool about leaf changing though is that you know not a lot of people understand like why do the leaves change color why do they go from green to yellow or to red or orange like why do we get that beautiful kind of mosaic of color that we see in the fall well it kind of all has to do with the sun and how it's positioned relative to the earth so the earth has its tilt and that's why we go through seasons you know from fall to winter to spring to summer so in the summertime the northern hemisphere is kind of ported, pointed more towards the sun. We're getting more sun. We're getting those longer days, warmer weather. But as the seasons change and the earth rotates and moves, now that sun is going to start going kind of lower and lower and lower into the southern sky. As the sun kind of moves its position in the sky, those wavelengths are not as efficient in the green spectrum, I guess you would say. And Basically, the plants start using other chemicals besides chlorophyll to photosynthesize. So the chemical change is what changes the actual color of the leaf. So the leaves aren't changing color because, you know, they're dying. They're actually changing color because the sun is being, the sun is becoming less efficient as an energy source as the winter approaches. So they actually have to kind of change their chemical composition to take advantage of the wavelengths of sunlight that are available right now. If you ever see a pile like this, these are really common, especially in these ponderosa pine forests. So the ponderosa pine trees are reliant on fires to cycle nutrients back into the soil. And that kind of cycle of destruction, regeneration, growth, fire, all of that is kind of going on throughout the tree's life cycle. The problem is in the 20th century, as we were moving further and further west, 
we stopped all those fires. We took a policy of fire suppression and we didn't allow natural fires to burn through our forests. Well, without those fires burning through, the smaller trees, they continue to grow, but nutrients were not properly cycling back into the soil. So the older trees were kind of being outcompeted by these younger saplings and it led to these heavily overgrown forests. And as the forests got thicker and thicker and thicker, all of that extra growth, that was just extra fuel for the fires to burn. So all that fire suppression actually led to forests that were more prone to these bigger catastrophic wildfires. Because those ponderosa pines with that high crown and lack of vegetation on the forest floor, they can survive the fires as long as they stay kind of low to the ground. But when you get all this extra growth into the forest, the fire can climb like a ladder up to the high crown of these pine trees. And then when the crowns ignite, the whole forest can be set ablaze. So those ladder fires are really, really bad. So today, to undo the work that was done in the 20th century of fire suppression and to prevent more and more ladder fires, the Forest Service has to do this. They have to do thinning, cleaning, and burning. So anytime you see a pile of wood out in the forest like this, this is typically what they would call a slash pile or a burn pile. So the Forest Service has come through and you can see, they actually physically cut down some of these trees, cut them apart, collected the debris from the forest, and then they bring it all together like this and pile it up. Just when the time is right, you know, the, the winds are low, the moisture is high, that's when the Forest Service will send a crew out here and they'll be able to burn this pile. Whenever you're out in the forest, traveling through the Ponderosa Pines, you see these piles, just know that that's work done by the Forest Service, trying to make for a better, natural, more healthy ecosystem. We don't just have ponderosas here in Arizona. You can find them in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, California, all throughout the West. They're a super common, super abundant tree. And as you're hiking through the ponderosa pine forests, you'll notice most of the trees grow as one nice, long, straight central trunk. And that's why they're really good lumber trees. You know, they make really long, nice pieces of wood. But something that you should be looking out for are trees that instead of having one long, nice straight trunk, they actually kind of split into two trunks. So right here, we've got a great example of the base of one ponderosa pine tree coming up, but then all of a sudden kind of veering off into two trunks. And then again, up there, it kind of splits again. There are a few more trees like that. This one right here has a really nice kind of V look to it. So when you're looking at these trees, you notice that most of the trees are that kind of long, straight type of pine tree. So why are these ones split? What happened to these trees? And believe it or not, porcupines, those pincushion animals that you see in the forest, they are the reason that these trees are split. So porcupines are a forest creature. They eat a variety of different plant material from leaves to acorns. But one thing in particular that they love to eat is the inner bark of trees. So as these trees are young little saplings, kind of like what you see over here, the porcupines in the wintertime will come through and start to kind of split the tree apart to eat that inner bark. Now, once they've eaten the bark, that tree is split and it starts to grow and it kind of veers away from one another. So after years and years of growth, all of a sudden, instead of one big long trunk, you've got these two splitting trunks that kind of break away from one another. Now these trees right here, are pretty old ponderosa pines. These are a little less than 100 years old, I would say. Once the tree reaches about 100 years in age, they actually turn orange in color. So it's another cool thing about ponderosas. If you see an orange one, you know that's an old growth tree. So this tree, sometime less than 100 years ago, a porcupine came through, split it open, took a little snack on the inner bark, and then years and years of growth later, we've got these really cool kind of V-ing trees that you'll find ever so kind of rarely throughout the ponderosa pine forests. Just looking at this tree, this one's pretty easy to tell, you know, that's a young tree. It's not that big yet, you know, what do we got? Maybe 20, 30 feet high here, not super thick around. And we've got this kind of darker colored bark. And then if you look over here, all right, this is a little bit bigger tree, a little bit taller, but we still have that dark coloration. So, that's how the tree grows as it's kind of maturing. And about 95 years into its life cycle, it finally reaches maturity. 
And you can see that kind of tree by looking at the color of the bark. So now over here, you can see a really massive tall ponderosa pine, nice and thick around. And we've got that bright orange, almost kind of like cinnamon color to the bark. So this tree right here is a centennial tree. This tree has survived in this forest for over a hundred years now. And you know, most people kind of date trees using things like tree ring dating, you know, cutting the tree open, counting the number of rings inside, getting an estimate of how many cycles of growth it's gone through. But it's really cool in these ponderosa pine forests how you don't have to have a cord, you don't have to have a cut of the tree. You can just kind of look at the outside of them and you won't know whether this tree is, you know, 100, 200, 300, could be about 500 years old. That's their average lifespan. Somewhere in that range is what you're going to see when you're looking for these kind of orange colored trunks. Another fun thing to do when you find these mature ponderosas is to kind of find the seams between the plates of bark. And as weird as it sounds, just stick your nose right in there. And you'll get a slight scent of vanilla, almost like a bowl of vanilla ice cream. And it's just kind of the way the sap and the um, pitch in the tree smells as it's growing. So if the tree is not actively growing, they don't always smell like vanilla, but sometimes in like the spring and summer, you can get these really kind of rich scents off of the tree. And you just kind of look like a weirdo putting your nose up to a tree, but it smells really cool. Northern Arizona, Southern Utah, Western Colorado, parts of New Mexico, it's all part of this massive uplifted landmass that geologists call the Colorado Plateau. So between about 70 million and 30 million years ago, the North American continental plate was hitting an ocean plate. And as that oceanic plate kind of subducted underneath the continent, it actually took a very shallow subduction, which kind of slid underneath all the rock layers and elevated them from sea level way up into the air, you know, up here at 7,000 feet. So right here, you can see all of those sedimentary rocks, or some of them at least, that we have here in northern Arizona. So looking across the canyon here, it really kind of just looks like a bunch of like gray tannish colored rock. But if you look closely, there are some interesting things you can see. So if you see kind of like the top of that cliff, you notice how there are like layers horizontally across that. Well, that's because that's part of what's called the Kaibab limestone. And that limestone was laid down as seabeds you know, 250, 270 million years ago or so. Then as you go down the wall of the canyon, all of a sudden that kind of horizontal stratification kind of disappears. And then you get another tan cliff. But if you look at the lines in there, they're actually kind of more diagonal and crisscrossing. And that's because that is what's called the Coconino sandstone, which is a lower layer of the Colorado Plateau. And instead of being formed as ocean floors, it was formed as sand dunes. So in the ocean sediments, you have this very nice horizontal banding, whereas in that Coconino sandstone, you've got this kind of cross bedding from those sand dunes that are petrified. Then just below that, if you can start to see some reddish colored rock, just below the Coconino sandstone, the next layer is what's called the Hermit Shale. And that's that kind of red rock that you see at the Grand Canyon. So that's what's really cool here. These rocks are the exact same kind of rocks you have at the very top layers of the Grand Canyon. But that geology is also kind of playing into why we have this beautiful vista here. So if you look off in the distance, we can see those San Francisco peaks again, really tall, high mountains. So in the winter time, as the storms come through, all that snow is going to kind of accumulate up on the top of those peaks. Then in spring, as that water melts, you know, that ground or that melt off is going to be pulled towards sea level by gravity. Now, those upper layers of the Colorado Plateau, the Kaibab limestone and the Coconino sandstone, they're kinds of sedimentary rock that are a little bit more permeable. Water can actually flow through them. So that Kaibab limestone creates karst systems that water can flow through. 
and the sandstone is a little bit more porous so the water can kind of drain through it. So you go down through a few layers as the water's draining through the ground, but then that shale layer, that shale is hardened clay. And kind of like what we were talking about earlier with Rogers Lake, how that clay seals in the bottom and kind of traps that water there. Well, as that water permeates through the limestone and through the sandstone, then all of a sudden it hits the shale that's less permeable. So instead of keeping going down, that shale kind of pushes the water out the side of the Colorado Plateau. So that's part of what they call the Coconino Aquifer. Basically the groundwater that falls around Flagstaff and the snow melt off of the San Francisco peaks all that kind of drains down until it hits that shale and as it goes further and further to the south kind of being drawn off the Colorado Plateau all of a sudden where that water escapes you start to get these big canyons carved and these different kind of passageways and this unique landscape that we see here. So this whole vista right here is all tied into the geology of the Colorado Plateau and then also the hydrology of the water table here. So it's just really cool that this beautiful view is all carved and built by natural processes. We're here at the East Pocket Lookout Tower, which is kind of the destination you're trying to get to when you're going to the edge of the world or the end of the world, as we call it here in Flagstaff. So this is an old Forest Service fire lookout tower, kind of similar to what I was talking about with Woody Mountain earlier, where you build these high up on nice elevated areas where you got good views of the surrounding terrain. And that way you can station a forest service ranger up there. They can keep their eyes out for fires or any kind of danger in the area. So if you're trying to get out to this area, driving down Woody Mountain Road, you can put in the East Pocket Lookout Tower and that will bring you right here if you Google it. So this is really good, just kind of point of reference that is easy to find, easy to get to. You do have to walk about a half a mile from where you park to get out here. So it is a little bit of a journey, but I think it's worth it as we'll see when we get out to the views. But eventually the world stops and you're on the edge. You get that feeling here. This is kind of the edge of the Colorado Plateau, that really uplifted landmass that makes up northern Arizona that we were talking about earlier. So from here, as we're looking out, we're looking down into Oak Creek Canyon. And Oak Creek Canyon is where you will find Highway 89A, which is one of Arizona's most scenic highways. So as you're standing here, you'll see the cars kind of running down the road, going down through the canyon, but that's also the path of the actual creek. And Oak Creek is home to Slide Rock State Park, which is another really cool location here in Arizona. Now, we're not gonna show you Slide Rock up close today, but if you look out from here on the edge of the world, look down towards the road, you'll see at the very bottom some reddish rock with a little bit of blue-green water flowing through it. That's Oak Creek and that's Slide Rock State Park. The Colorado Plateau does, you know, extend slightly beyond where we are. All these rocks still contain that Kaibab limestone, Coconino sandstone, the layers we were talking about earlier, but now it's starting to be carved and cut up by Oak Creek, by the West Fork, by Sycamore Creek down a ways. You know, those aquifers are starting to pump water out the side of the Colorado Plateau, creating these creeks, carving these canyons. And sometimes the creeks and waterways kind of carve around the plateau so much that they create these isolated mountains. So as you're looking across from the edge of the world here, the next big plateau you see on the other side of the canyon, that's actually known as Wilson Mountain. So it's not really a mountain like we were talking about earlier with the volcanoes that kind of erupted and grew and are like big points and pinnacles. This was a mountain that was carved by the land kind of eroding away around it as Oak Creek and West Fork and Sycamore Creek kind of make their way down to the Verde River. 
then the Verde River leads into the Salt River, and the Salt River takes that water down to the lower Colorado, and then it makes its way out into the ocean. So these rocks right here are the same kind of rocks that you see at the upper layers of the Grand Canyon, and the water flowing here will also eventually make its way into the Colorado River downstream of Grand Canyon. But it's all connected. This whole Southwest Colorado Plateau system is really, really interesting as far as geology and hydrology go. And that's why geologists have been studying the Colorado Plateau for 200 years or so now.